There are three big problems with used vehicle appraisals. One, manually sifting through comp vehicles. Two, old book values and ghost comps. Three, no recon visibility. You can solve them all with AutoVision, launching in the Reynolds & Reynolds booth at NADA. Learn more at reyrey.com slash used dash cars. That's R-E-Y-R-E-Y dot -E -E com slash used dash cars. Want to dive deeper into the topics you hear about on Daily Drive? We're offering listeners a special offer, 20% off a one-year Automotive News digital subscription. That gets you access to all of our news, information, and analysis made for automotive industry leaders like you. Go to autonews.com slash daily drive promo to redeem. Welcome to Daily Drive for Thursday, January 18th, 2023. I'm Jamie Butters, Executive Editor of Automotive News in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today on the show, we now know which company Mark Stewart will lead after leaving the top post at Stellantis North America. Nissan could pull production of the Rogue out of the U.S. And Honda expects another double-digit sales uptick in the U.S. this year. Plus, the buzz phrase around CES this month was software-defined vehicles. We'll hear from Bill Pinnell, Vice President and Head of Automotive Software Product Management at Qualcomm, about what that actually means and why it's important for the future of the industry. People are actually showing it being used, and that's people are like, okay, this, this really can actually get into a product or get into a solution for a customer. Let's run through all the news you need to know to keep up in the auto industry. Stellantis North America Chief Mark Stewart will be Goodyear's new CEO. Stellantis announced Tuesday that Stewart was leaving the automaker after a five-year stint as COO of North America. He will be replaced by Carlos Zarlenga, president of Stellantis's Mexico unit. Stewart oversaw record profits for the company's North American business in 2022. Last year, Stellantis was the only automaker to see a drop in U.S. sales. Last July, under pressure from activist shareholders, Goodyear initiated a review to maximize the stock market value after shedding jobs to deal with softening demand and spiraling inflation. Stewart's new role begins January 29th. Nissan has told suppliers it is considering moving U.S. production of the next-generation road crossover to Japan. That's if the automaker can't lower its purchasing cost. People briefed on the matter told Automotive News that Nissan is asking suppliers for a 20% cut in parts pricing on average. The Rogue is Nissan's best-selling U.S. model. It's currently built at plants in Tennessee and Japan. The compact crossover accounts for one-third of Nissan sales in its largest market. At a meeting this month at Nissan North America headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee, the automaker told suppliers that it expects significant reduction in the cost of parts for the fourth-generation Rogue. The model is scheduled to begin production in late 2026. Meanwhile, Nissan North America has poached Lexus marketing chief Vinay Shahani to help drive the automaker's top line in a slowing economy. As senior vice president of U.S. marketing and sales, Shahani will oversee key businesses for the Nissan brand. He will also have oversight of Infinity Americas. Shahani replaces Michael Colloran, who retires on March 31st after more than 12 years with Nissan. An American Honda is targeting sales of 1.4 million vehicles in 2024. That would be a 10% increase over 2023. American Honda sales chief Mamadou Diallo told reporters that he expects the Honda brand to sell between 1.2 and 1.3 million vehicles and Acura to log sales of 150,000. The Japanese automaker closed last year with 1.16 million sales for Honda and more than 145,000 for Acura. Both brands notched double-digit gains and their combined sales were up 33%. And those are today's headlines. Jamie, what are your thoughts on Nissan considering moving production of their best-selling U.S. model, the Rogue? Can Nissan make all of those in Japan? Probably not. And... The suppliers here in the U.S. kind of felt like that protected them. Um, they can't make them all in Japan. They're going to keep making them here. But what our sources said is that uh, the suppliers were told if they have to, they will free up some factory space in Japan by moving some of the Japanese rogue production to China. 
that could be a real game changer. It makes the threat a lot more real and uh, puts pressure on these suppliers for cuts that really none of them can withstand. That's interesting. Uh, Coming up, we'll hear from Bill Pinnell of Qualcomm about the company's automotive software business and how technology could reshape cars and trucks in the coming years. That's next on Daily Drive. Daily Drive is kicking off the new year by reviving an old name in a new format. We're bringing back a weekend drive edition of Daily Drive. Jamie and I will go deeper into the biggest automotive stories of the week. Every weekend, you'll hear fresh insights, analysis, and what has me running hot, if not overheated. To think that's going to get done in a year, a little over a year, is um, foolishly optimistic. That's that's a little dark, but let's shift to something (laughs) a little more positive. You'll also hear from our experts in the newsroom here at Automotive News about the latest industry trends and topics. EV sales are not declining. That's the narrative we're kind of seeing outside of the industry. They aren't declining, but the pace of growth definitely has slowed. Come back this weekend for our Weekend Drive edition of Daily Drive. And of course, tune in every weekday for all the news you need to know to keep up in the auto industry. Data is the backbone of your used vehicle department. You need it to find accurate comp sets and to best understand your market in order to make precise appraisal and pricing decisions. But it feels like you're always struggling to get the information you need. How much time do you spend sifting through comps because there are outliers that don't match the vehicle you're appraising? Do you frequently make manual adjustments to pricing recommendations? Reynolds' newest inventory management solution, AutoVision, can help. A.J. McGowan, president and founder of AutoVision, explains how. If you look at the way that cars are traditionally priced, you know, you can get down to specifics in terms of, you know, what zip code is it in and, you know, what options does it have on it? You know, some of those sorts of things. Um, But the thing that's never really taken into account um, is, you know, that dealer's, you know, specific view of the market. Our goal with AutoVision was to use, you know, technology that's available now to do real-time processing which allows dealers to really set the their view of the market into AutoVision. And then we use our tools to analyze the data that's there and show them this is what this vehicle is worth to you. AutoVision can help you run your used vehicle department with precise comp sets, real-time inventory data, and reconditioning insights. Visit reyrey.com slash used dash cars to find out more. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used Dash cars. Welcome back to Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. Qualcomm is well known for its semiconductors and wireless technology, but the company has a massive and ever-growing presence in the automotive industry across a lot of different verticals. It's playing a big role in the development of software-defined vehicles, a phrase that has become increasingly ubiquitous in the automotive tech world in recent years. Bill Pinnell is vice president and head of automotive software product management at Qualcomm. Last week at CES, he spoke with our own Pete Bigelow on Shift, a podcast about mobility. Here's a piece of their conversation. There's a lot of excitement here at CES about the software-defined vehicle. I can't, can't walk from here to the next stand without seeing it somewhere, or hearing it. Uh, we've heard about software-defined vehicles for a long time. Why, why is it a front-burner topic here in 2024? I, I think that the main reason that we're seeing a lot of excitement around SDV at this show is that before, like IAA and also particular companies have been working on SDV and talking about SDV for a couple of years, there hasn't actually been any practical demonstration. So people haven't really been able to look past what is like slideware and concepts and actually see, okay, what does this actually mean for me as, a, as an OEM or a tier one or in fact, you know, as looking through the eyes of the consumer? That's interesting because I feel like one of the themes of this show overall, even beyond software defined vehicles, is that there's a, a maturity to the product we're seeing. It's near market, it's entering the market. It's not, here's something we're going to do in the future. Yeah, so I think uh, people are like, so consolidation, this is the progress we're making. This is actually one of the things that Qualcomm is, is um, being messaging from our side, is that you know, we have fantastic business, which we're very, very, uh, you know, very fortunate to have with many, many customers. It's about the maturity, about real stuff rather than vapor stuff. 
So, um, you know, I think that's a, and that's also true for like Gen AI. So Gen AI is like interesting at the show because everybody's, there's a buzz, but I think people are actually showing it being used and that's people are like, okay, this, this really can actually get into a product or get into a, uh, a solution for a customer. Bill, I've heard you talk about how the software defined vehicle is, is something more than the feature that we see. And I feel like that's kind of how a lot of people, and maybe me, tend to think about software defined vehicles in the, in the industry. But this is, this is something more of a philosophy. Yeah, I mean, if we take a step back, what do we really mean by software defined vehicle? For me, it starts with, you know, it, it's what, what it says on the words, right? You define what you're going to do in the vehicle by software that you want to run in the vehicle in the future, right? right? Well, in the future for startup production, but also this isn't just about startup production. This is something that you want to support for seven, ten years going forward. So one of the key principles of software defined vehicle for me is that it, you need the OEMs want this because they know the customers want a fresh modern, something that keeps up with the rest of consumer electronics, you know, which is why we're here at the CES, right? Because the whole point of automotive coming into CES was people wanted more of a consumer electronic experience in their car. So that's why Qualcomm got into it in 2015 when we started doing, utilizing all the experience we'd had building phones with the latest, greatest, you know, whatever operating system was, you know, primarily Android, and they wanted that experience in the car. So that's how it all started. So, you know, that's how software became in, but it was still software on top of a hardware-defined vehicle experience. So people like, okay, what chip do I need? I'll put that in, and then I'll, like, figure out what software I'm going to do. This is turning it around. Software-defined vehicle is, hang on a second, I need to know that I'm going to have the latest, greatest software experience, features, user experience, whatever it is, Gen AI, if it's coming. And therefore, if I start with that future vision and an idea of what I need in the future, then I can develop my chip, my hardware, my you know e architecture, to use the terminology of the automakers, right? So, you know, that's so it's reversing the traditional model, and that's not just about the the chips and the and the hardware. It's also about how you develop software. So I think that's what you're going on to, Pete. That would, that would be so, my next. Uh, yeah, that that's perfect segue into. To continuing that. So, in terms of you know, when I say methodology, what do I mean? So, if you're going to do really complicated software experiences in vehicles, and I think people talk about the you know number of lines of code that it's like ten times or twenty times the nine the number of code that's in a Boeing you know triple seven, right? Um, so it's there's a lot of tens of millions of lines of code or hundreds even. So if you've got that sort of software that you need to do, and you need to keep it fresh, and you need to add on the latest version of Amazon or Android or whatever it is that the, you know, we, the consumer and the OEM want to, want to do, then you need a, a different um, software design and development methodology. Now in the rest of the industry, especially particularly in cloud, this is not new. So what we call cloud native development, doing um, you know, cloud development, people writing code that runs in the cloud, that's microservices, SOA. These are all very, very uh, established principles. Now we're seeing that come into automotive. So we've got, right, I want to develop, I don't want to have to use a particular hardware board like for my developer. Like how many hardware boards do I need to buy for my 200 developers? No, 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 no. I want thousands of developers that I can go to they're going to be developing in the cloud. They're going to be using modern containerized technology, uh, you know, like an open container initiative container that's going to run either infotainment or digital cockpit or even ADAS functionality now can be containerized and run in these high performance compute platforms that software defined vehicle is really designed for. So, um, I mean, one of the one of the things I was going to make it more tangible is. How does, that, how does that actually take place? So one of the things we do with OEMs and uh, tier ones and other software suppliers, we work in what's called a software factory. What the so, heck's, what the heck's a software factory, Bill? Um, there's no smokestacks or anything like that. Um, so a software factory is basically a, a collaborative model that you set up uh, many parties that can basically take code from multiple suppliers, 
from traditional tier ones or modern ODMs that are going to be building hardware, as well as the OEM, because the OEM has like got their signature applications or secret source that they want to bring into their car. And instead of having the traditional sort of model where you'd have a hierarchy of tiers, tier three supplying software to a tier two, to supplying software to a tier one, and hardware along the way as well, and then the tier one working with the OEM. And that model worked for the sort of lower complexity that we've had in you know 15 years. But now, if you've got all these bits of software coming from with hundreds of millions of lines of code, then you need to all work together. And that sort of sounds very kumbaya, and, but it's, it's really, it's a, uh, it's a model where when you push something into the software factory, you're using agile methodology, so you're doing you know, product increment sprints, doing user stories, you're demoing the code to the different suppliers and management within the OEM. You're showing, for instance, the latest HMI feature. You know, it could be something like a, a new augmented reality feature that you've got on your HUD that you want to show off to the management team and you basically have worked on your user story, the product team have developed it, they haven't completely fleshed it out but you demo it on this day and the management say no we, we think that we need that to be over here or change this or do whatever and the teams will work together to make that happen. But there's dependencies on different suppliers, you don't have to make maybe be um, responsible for someone else's code working because that wouldn't really be uh, that would be a, a lot of work but you have an established this starts to sound a little bit boring but you have a test and design methodology of test plans where you're responsible for my API works I've proved it works therefore when I test it with someone else's if it doesn't work then there must be something wrong with them and you all work together in collaboration. Bill Pinnell is Vice President and Head of Automotive Software Product Management at Qualcomm. He spoke with our own Pete Bigelow on Shift, a podcast about mobility. You can hear the full conversation on Shift wherever you get your podcasts. That's Daily Drive for today. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News Coordinating Producer Jake Neer, as well as our own Arvash Kakaria and Carly Schaffner for their reporting for today's podcast. You can get the latest news on tech and innovation, manufacturing, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Come back tomorrow for a look at how some dealership finance and insurance offices are widening selection of indirect auto lenders to give car buyers more options. As you see less lenders, that can create affordability issues for the consumer uh, because there's not as many options and more options creates more competition. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.